Coming to you from the heart of the Diocese of Savannah, this is It's Catholic, Y'all, a series of conversations about faith and life. Views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of the Diocese of Savannah. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here. My name is Betsy Debris, and um, I am a teacher of symptothermal natural family planning for over 20 years. Good morning. My name is Sarah Schweiner. Um, I've actually been an NFP user for about nine years now, but just recently became certified to teach FIM, um, which stands for Fertility Education and Medical Management. Um, so that's what I'm teaching now, and it kind of helps women understand some hormonal issues, as well as um, it's a method for natural family planning. Hi, I'm Sally Kennedy, and I was trained to teach the Creighton Method over 30 years ago. I recently retired from teaching the method. I call myself a self-appointed consultant now, but if there were ever a need, I would get back in it. Hello, everyone. I'm Colby. Uh, I have been using NFP for about five years. I was taught Creighton by Sally, and then she invited me to get certified, so I got certified in Marquette. Uh, Well, I'm finishing up that certification process. In a few months, I'll be done with that. And I have two kids. All right, great. Well, I know we're excited to get into NFP and talk about NFP, Um, obviously, which stands for Natural Family Planning. So we've got some topics, I guess, we're going to go through. So um, let's look at one of the first questions, I guess. It says, for people who are unfamiliar with the term Natural Family Planning, or NFP, what is a super simple description of what it is. It's it's exactly what it says. It's a natural way to fam- plan your family as opposed to um, using any chemicals or barriers. It just simply observes a woman's natural occurring signs of fertility and infertility. And it's in keeping with the church's teaching not to separate the love and the life aspect of the sexual union. I think that's great. I think it's just important that it, that you think about it as a way to either achieve or avoid pregnancy. Mm-hmm. It really can be used for both, which is important yes. throughout family planning. Right. Um, I guess the only thing maybe I'd add is that it's just a way to collect data that tells when a woman is fertile or infertile within her cycle and then using that information, mm-hmm. um, the couple can then make a decision about how they want to plan their family. So it's really a, a, a data collection method, but it's also gives the opportunity for discernment, discernment while practicing marital chastity. How did you become involved in NFP instruction? Sally, why don't you start? You've been doing it the longest. <laughs> I had a phone call from Bishop Lassard. <laughs> he found out that I was a Creighton user. I'd written him a letter saying that we need a family life office here in Savannah, and I didn't want to have any part of it, but I would help get up the energy because that's what I'm good at. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he called me on the phone and said, I've been stymied in this regard, trying to find someone to instruct. And within six months, he had me sent off to Creighton, and I worked collaboratively with St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, I think St. Joseph and the diocese paid for my tuition, and um, that was that. You know, it's been such a blessing in our life. I couldn't say no when he asked me to teach because somebody had to do it. Yeah, that's great. I'll go next because I've been teaching the next longest, I guess. (laughs) Um, So I was very familiar with NFP just because my parents, my mom had used it, and so I was familiar with it. And so um, I didn't really get trained. Uh, We moved to Savannah, and I met Sally, and she kind of gave me like a basic – Training in NFP, not really symptothermal, uh, not really Creighton, but I wound up doing symptothermal. Um, and that was kind of neat. And then Stella Kitchens, which I don't remember, was she like the director of family she life did. at she that came time? In from Pittsburgh, I think. From right. Pittsburgh so she diocese. came Harrisburg diocese. Harrisburg, yeah. So Stella Kitchens, who at the time worked at the at the diocese, um, came in and did a training session to teach um women how to actually teach NFP to couples because we really had, I think there was what you, Sally, who was teaching yeah. NFP at the time. Yeah. So this was in 2002. And so um, I got trained at that time and I've been teaching couples ever since. Um, and it's been great. And now, I, I mean, I'm grateful because I'm a very supportive pastor. So we've actually been doing a lot of great just NFP outreach. So having a mission at our church, um, speaking to some of the uh, like youth groups and um, high school students about this topic, because as you've probably all know, like by the time people come to you, they're in their thirties and they're like, what is this weird NFP thing you want to tell me about? Right. So we're, we're, we really want to try and reach people 
earlier so that they can be familiar with it, Absolutely. not a month before they're getting married, which <laughs> seems to be what <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> tends to happen. I don't know. That's yes. that's kind of been my experience mm-hmm. a little bit. So how about you, Sarah? Yeah. So like I said, I've been using NFP for about nine years. I learned it before I got married. Um, I learned Creighton originally um, in Atlanta, and my husband and I used that for um, about two years. And then after my second child was born, I ended up switching to Marquette. Um, I really liked just um, kind of having that extra set of data just to make sure um, we were avoiding when we needed to and that kind of thing. Um, And that was working well for a while. And then I started to experience just some health issues myself and some hormonal imbalances. And I was seeing um, a wonderful gynecologist, a Catholic doctor in Atlanta um, through a practice called Reproductive Health and Medicine. And they recommended that I learn FEM. So I myself learned it and started to use FEM and I really fell in love with it as uh, from a health standpoint, it helped me to really learn about my body more than I had before, but also from using it for family planning reasons as well. So I, I learned that personally and then decided to get trained and certified in FIM um, because I really felt like it empowered me to make better decisions about my health. And then, of course, the family planning aspect was important to us as well. And as I said before, Sally taught me Creighton when I first got married, and it worked great for those uh, that first year or two when we were trying to get uh, established as a married couple, and then it worked great for getting our first con- conceived. And then I realized that Creighton did not work for me postpartum, <laughs> and so that's how my second kid happened so quickly. And so I decided to get uh, switch to Marquette, which worked a lot better for me postpartum. And then Sally suggested that I get certified. And so I'm almost done getting certified in that. Yay. It's great. It's great. Very exciting. Yes. We need to bring in a new it's new awesome. generation because Sally and I have been doing this for It's awesome. And even at Arthur time. Kane at St. James this past weekend, we had uh, Sarah was there with her husband. And we'll get you there soon enough, you and Colby. I mean, you and Jared. But we had so many young couples part of pre Cana as the team. And that was great. That's yeah. Great. Time to get new blood in. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so here's a, we love this topic here. It says, the church is always forbidden the use of artificial contraception, which we will get into a bit more as we go. But instead of starting with why something is wrong, let's start with the big picture, the purpose of a human sexual relationship. Um, I'd, I'd like to address this a little bit, uh, and I can't take any credit for this. Listening to Father Mike Schmitz has uh, been a great, uh, great, great way to increase my, my knowledge and understanding. So I think one of the things I learned from him, every created thing has a has a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, everything that we see, like this this mug has the purpose of being able to hold a liquid so that I can drink it without getting it all over the place. Um, you know, the table has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. And so when you look at things, I think from that point of view, what is the purpose of something? So we need to ask, well, what is the purpose of sexual intimacy? what is the purpose of us being here? Like we're created for a purpose, you know, to have a relationship with God. And so God created sexual intimacy for a reason. Well, let's find out what that reason is. And so um, through the church and just through natural reasoning, we can figure out, well, sexual intimacy within marriage has the purpose of two purposes that you have to honor. So you've got the procreative side, you know, being able to have children, and then you have the unitive side, which is having that bonding, growing in love. And so the Catholic Church is actually super consistent on on these things because anytime you distort the purpose of something, you're causing problems. It's going against God's plan. And so when you look at things like artificial contraception, if you've got two purposes with artificial contraception, you are removing one of the main purposes of sexual amnesty, which is procreation, which is life. So as soon as you remove that, you've got a problem. You're misusing sexuality. And that's true with everything. So like in vitro fertilization, why does the church say that isn't right? Like, hey, it'd be great to have more babies. Why isn't it okay? Because you're removing the unitive, the love portion of sexual intimacy so you don't even have that you're actually having just life without union or love so again you're misusing that purpose and then um you know things like masturbation there's no life or love there so again when you look at the church's 
teaching on sexual ethics, like where they come from, why they say some things are okay and some things aren't, it all goes back to if it isn't okay, there's a misuse of the purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing, like, well, why can't you just use artificial contraception? Mm -hmm. Because you have to look deeper, not just what's convenient, but what actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't does anyone else have? Yeah, we should call okay. it love and yeah. life or babies and bonding. I mean, just the two go together. And when you distort one or take one out, it doesn't just affect that, it also affects the other. So if you take the life giving out, it's going to also affect the union. And those are insights from John Paul II that we've gained. And we can see that to our own lives probably. But when you take one out, you're going to also diminish the other aspect. So they go together and inanimate objects like these glasses and that cup, they can be used for another purpose without destroying their, their end. But human persons can never be used for anything but love. We're made to be loved and to love and be loved. And that's the only proper way to, to view the human person. Let's talk about some of the negatives. Um, just a warning, this part can be a difficult topic to discuss, maybe triggering to some listeners. Artificial contraception, sorry about that, has many problems associated with it, including physical, moral, relational, and societal. It is something people write whole books about and dedicate their lives to addressing. So we're barely going to be able to scratch the surface mm -hmm. here. Um, let's talk about how artificial contraception, more specifically hormonal contraception, affects the lives of individual women first, and then we'll talk about its effect on our world at large. I was yeah. going to say for this, just with NFP, there's really no health risk. Um, you're, in fact, you're learning more about your body. You're gaining insight into your health. And then on the flip side with artificial contraception, um, it comes along with a lot of health risks. Probably don't have time to go into detail about all of these health risks, but it's basically designed to disrupt a perfectly normal function within our body. So there's going to be health risks in the short term and in the long term. So that's well, and those are super well documented. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then if you open up the the pay, you know the pharmaceutical paperwork that comes with it, right. you know all the yes, things that all right, right, right. I mean, from you know from low libido to stroke and death. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it it covers the gamut. But I do want to say, too, we're talking about contraception um, here in this conversation when it's used to avoid a pregnancy. Some people are prescribed hormonal contraception for medical purposes. And just to be clear, the church doesn't have a moral issue with that. However, Correct. however, the the risk and the health risk are still there, and you have to make sure they outweigh that's one aspect. And the other thing is there are doctors who will help you find alternative ways to treat whatever pathology you have without resorting to hormonal contraceptive. Because if you use hormonal contraceptives and you're engaging in intercourse, you're married and you're engaging in intercourse, the very, very sad reality, and it says it right inside the packet of, of pills and all hormonal contraceptives work th this way, that the backup, backup method of these hormonal contraceptives is abortifacient. They send the lining wall of the uterus, so just in case an egg is released and there's enough cervical mucus to facilitate the sperm transport, the third me method of, you know, mechanism of all hormonal contraceptives is they disrupt the lining wall of the uterus so that then if that new little life makes its way down the fallopian tube and tries to implant, there's not a hospitable um, you know, place for it. So, and I remember finding that out early on, uh, you know, and I remember thinking, because like many people, you know, when I got married, there was no, I mean, I hate to say it, but 40 years ago this June, uh, about this time, 40 years ago, we went to an engaged encounter weekend. And I asked, what about the pill? Because I was thinking about going on it because that's what you did 40 years ago. And now they put you on it when you're 13, 14, and 15. God yeah. bless these young girls. But no one at that engaged encounter could answer that question. They didn't give us any information, despite the fact that there was a very uh, flourishing program in South Carolina. So I was on the pill for the first two months of our married life. And then saw a brochure in the back of the church at Fort Jackson about natural feminine planning. And I said, oh, I think this is what I've been looking for. And, uh, you know, so I saw that. But I remember finding out that the pill could be abortifacient and just having to grapple with that. And um, so I think it's important people understand that. And that's very triggering, I'm sure. But it is reality. So... So if, and I'm getting off on a tangent here, but if a doctor has prescribed hormonal contraceptive for some pathology, 
and you're engaged in intercourse, you need to understand that and maybe you'll find an alternative treatment to it because there are there are doctors who will help you do that. Like yeah. Sarah's like Sarah's doctor in, in Atlanta. They're wonderful, yeah. Wonderful. And you can go to them from Savannah. You can have contact. Yes, yeah, so I them. still see them virtually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, and isn't it true that because of that aspect of um, a hormonal contraceptive, does not does the church then teach that you should abstain if you're using it for a medical right. well, purpose? Right. Well, you know, that's that really getting into kind the of weeds here. Okay. It's getting into <laughs> the weeds here. But um, I would say talk to a priest about that. Right, yeah. right. Talk to the spirit. Yeah. I'd also like to add one emotional impact on women with hormonal concert, contraception, at least speaking personally. I, I've never used hormonal contraception, but I think as we age as young women, you can start having a dissociation with your own femininity mm -hmm. by how masculine-based culture is in a certain sense, because I started hating my body because oh these periods are so terrible and this and that but then as i learned nfp and started understanding the four different stages of my cycle and what's happening with my hormones and what i'm capable what i'm more capable of at this time of my cycle maybe i'm a little bit more socially capable in the follicular stage right and then uh, maybe i'm a little bit more withdrawn and i do more introspective stuff when i'm on my period because the two hemispheres of my brain are communicating more readily. So when I started seeing it more in that way, it made me appreciate my dynamic femininity and made it so that I didn't want to suppress femininity. I wanted to embrace it and mm -hmm. capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's and that something is so that powerful. Can, I always yeah, tell you very true that learning and practicing NFP was the most empowering thing I've ever done as a woman. Right. It's just it it yeah. It just so respects the feminine nature of women, which is a beautiful thing. Fertility is not the enemy. Right. right. I mean, the, all of society has made fertility an enemy until you suddenly decide you want to have a child. And now you have to move heaven and earth and then do all these crazy, crazy things right. to now have a child. And um, it, it, it really, I mean, the physical aspects are, are terrible, like the side effects that women suffer. The moral aspects, I mean, you have to think about it, like what is this doing to your soul? Because this mm -hmm. is a this is a serious, you know, problem that you're having. If you're aware of what the moral effects mm -hmm. of birth control are, if you're using it to avoid pregnancy, there are some serious ramifications for that. So that's gonna affect mm -hmm. you spiritually. And then I think they're really, you know, we talked it says, you know, talk about well, how does it hurt women and then like what is its effect on the world at large? Um you know, what happens with artificial birth control is all of a sudden all this is put on the woman Everything and is. she, a woman now becomes um, just an object of pleasure. She loses her human dignity because she has sterilized herself to become an object of pleasure for another, another per for a man. And so you're like, well, how, how is that empowering? I don't, I don't understand that. So you have that, that spiritual malaise that is going to come with that. The fact that, oh, I'm not worthy, like there's something wrong with me inherently because I'm a woman who can be fertile. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does that do to the psyche of women? To if women. anyone, you know, is really interested in this topic, and I hope everybody is, go to Humanity Vitae. Very short and cyclical by Pope Paul VI. Some of the cyclical are Absolutely. easier to read than others. This is super this easy. This is super easy to read. And Pope Paul VI lays out the societal ills that will come, the personal and societal ills that will come if there's widespread contraceptive use. This was in 1968 when the pill was just coming on the scene. And all of his predictions have come true. Mm -hmm. And men who already are tempted to use women will more readily use women. Governments will begin to use contraception as a form of coercing population control. Yes. I mean, more and the United States is one of the worst. Right. Like we're not gonna we're not gonna give you this money that you need so desperately unless you also to serve world countries, to serve yeah. world countries right. unless you accept our I ideology right. Right. on not just contraception but all sorts of strange. We're really going things. into the whole thing here, but <laughs> humanity vitae is so powerful and it, and it makes an appeal to couples, to men of science, to pastors. It makes an appeal to everyone to really understand this issue and and promote it in your field wherever you are, because it's really, if we can get the love and life right in a married couple, as John Paul II says, as the family goes, so goes the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to get this right. Yeah, I guess, you know, worldwide from another perspective, what you're saying, how we're 
forcing this thing on people that don't want it. Um, and then there's also some of the ramifications people don't realize too. There's so much hormonal, I don't even know what you would call it, but hormones in our systems. What about the fish that are now androgynous right. because right. they have so many hormones. And so hormones the levels water. of estrogen and other hormones in our water mm -hmm. that people are ingesting on a daily basis right. and, and male fertility has declined a huge amount. I mean, it's, it's, I find, I think it's declined something like 70% in the last 40 or 50 oh, years. Wow. Wow. And so, um, when they look at, you know, rates of male fertility now versus 50 years ago, and you're like, okay, well, the hormones that women ingest that comes out through their urine, that mm -hmm. all eventually gets, doesn't get completely filtered out of right. our water right. system. Right. And so you have to ask, well, how much role, you know, how much of a role is that playing in the reduction in male fertility and even female fertility, right. you know, cause we're, we're taking all these chemicals in. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's that to think about, um, you know, and I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, it really helps promote a culture of death because what happens is people rely on artificial contraception and then it doesn't work. And then they go get an abortion because they're already in either in an illicit relationship or they don't want people to find out. So it just promotes this culture of death everywhere. So if you eliminate the issues with artificial hormonal contraception, you really also start to eliminate a vast number of the abortions right. that are being and obviously, perpetrated. And you, and you know this, not every couple is going to resort to abortion. No, of course but not. If you look at the philosopher uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, she makes that argument. And I'll get into the ways you can look her up. She talks about using contraception as like putting up burglar bars on your window. And if that fetus still finds his way in, you did everything you could, so now you're no longer responsible. That's a philosophical argument that's been made for, you know, 40 years by this woman, Judith Jarvis Thompson, and many others picked up. But we trust that most people of goodwill would not resort to abortion. But certainly, again, John Paul II and Maritasa Splendor said abortion and contraception are fruits of the same tree. Same tree. Well, and even not maybe specific abortion, but just the abortifacient potential. Right, right. Um, I mean, IUDs, uh, that's their primary mechanism. But a lot of times women go, they're not told that. They're, they're just told that, oh, an IUD will keep the sperm from reaching the egg. Right. And that's actually, yes, that, that's part of it. But that's, that's not the main way an IUD works. It actually right. is abortifacient first. Meaning and it disrupts, the line, it disrupts the, the line of the uterus so that a newly conceived child cannot right. implant. Right. And so um, they don't like to tell women this. No. And that's another reason where you can tell like, hey, maybe artificial contraception is something you want to question because it is, they they lie about the effects. They lie about what could happen to women. And you, ha you have to ask, ask the question, well, are they really having our best interests at heart with this? quote unquote medication. I think it really has helped to destroy the relationship between men and women. Like really putting, pitting men and women against each other, um, you know, and putting everything on the woman for having the responsibility for fertility and, and childbirth, you know, who, well, it's your mm -hmm. fault. You weren't on, you know, you weren't on the pill. Um, th you things of that nature, you right. Day. You missed. So <laughs> It, yeah. it it just it puts the separation between the two and you look how divided people are these days and it's just one more division that I think would be completely unnecessary. Well, that's a good way to you talk about the positives of natural family planning. It's absolutely it has to be a couple's effort, as we all know. You know, the husband and wife together, the wife obviously observes her signs, but the husband and wife together understand what's going on, and then make decisions about their intimate life based on where they are in their marriage, what some serious reasons may be to avoid a pregnancy, and well, maybe they're not so serious after all. Maybe we won't avoid a pregnancy. They're communicating all the time, as you know. If you can communicate about, you know, your cervical mucus, about your hormones, about where you are in your cycle, Obviously, you can communicate about a lot of other You can talk yeah. about anything, yeah. right? Yeah. We all agree that <laughs> yes. Yes. And it, yes. And it helps establish your needs on a day to day basis because mm -hmm. if your husband is in touch with where you're at in your cycle and what that might mean hormonally for you and how he can support you in different ways because right. we're dynamic creatures, right. it's not just the same thing every day. So it, it educates them as well. What would you two young couple, I love it that we have these. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> what would y'all say about some people? Um, you know, say that the, the abstinence is not natural in a marriage and it's not good for a marriage to have periodic abstinence, which is how NFP works. 
If for a reason that you've discerned together as a couple, you have a just reason to avoid a pregnancy at this time, you simply abstain during the fertile time as opposed to putting a barrier, you know, tell the Lord and give her a wife, you're not welcome here right now. I'm going to put this barrier up. Instead, you say to the Lord and give her a wife, the Holy Spirit, we feel like at this point it would not be responsible of us, would not be prudent of us. So we're simply going to abstain during this time. We're not disinviting you. We want you to be with us every act of lovemaking. We're going to abstain. So what would you say about that absence and how does that, obviously it can be hard, how does it benefit your marriage? Or does it benefit your marriage, I should say, the, the periodic abstinence? Yeah, I was going to say, first of all, I definitely agree with you. It can be hard. I mean, that period of time can be difficult and sometimes think, oh, it's not fair. Like, you know, there's these other methods that we could be doing. But we we know that by doing this, we are um, obedient to the church. Um, we know that there will be blessings in our marriage because of this. And I think ultimately, I think it improves our communication with each other, like you mentioned before, and just making sure that we're um, praying about this together, discerning this every month um, and communicating about when the right time to have another child is or to delay. And also to add on to that, just the ability to connect. It it encourages you to connect in other ways Mm -hmm. when you do have to abstain. And I completely agree. It is hard. It won't ever stop being hard. I pray that it won't ever stop being hard because right. that's a good sign as a right. couple. Yeah. <laughs> if it gets yeah. a really, really easy to abstain, then <laughs> maybe you got to right. kindle the fire right. a little bit. Uh, so I see it as something I'm grateful for, that it's hard. And I also, yeah, the whole encouraging to connect in other ways. Sometimes we try to schedule something yeah. else that's really fun and out of the house for us to do to connect As so that it can just the <laughs> right. on the just, sofa, right? yeah exactly so <laughs> right. that's another benefit right. yeah right. and then people talk about that second honeymoon and i think i mean maybe you see that like mm-hmm. a built-in honeymoon every cycle right because yeah. you have abstained when you're trying to avoid a pregnancy you have abstained and then you have this natural time that you can come back together again and it makes it all the more what do we say abstinence makes a heart performance yeah. Yeah. i think that's true anyway and i will say one thing that can kind of the other side of that coin is that sometimes when you do get to your periods where you don't have to abstain. I also want to emphasize that in a marriage, you know, you don't have to put that pressure on each other. Some people talk about, I don't know if you've heard this from your friends, but feeling pressured that, oh, well, now that we can, we have to. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to. You can still keep it natural and spontaneous and all that. There's plenty of ways that you can keep it spontaneous within that time. Mm -hmm. And if you're working on your relationship, it's, yeah, you're, you it's not going to mess you up in in those terms, I guess. I, mm-hmm. I think one of the great things about it um, is that it helps both both partners build sacrificial love for each other, mm-hmm. which is the key because marriage is a vocation, right? So, you know, God created us. He called us to a vocation, and our vocation is supposed to bring us closer to God. So your husband's supposed to make you holier. You're supposed to, he's supposed to make you holier. You're supposed to make him holier. So how does that happen? Only through the growth of sacrificial love. And so if you know your husband is willing to wait or you're willing to wait over this time, then that's saying, I love you enough to wait. I care enough about you. I care enough about us. And that growth of sacrificial love is actually bringing us closer to the Lord, like Mm -hmm. developing our relationship with God, which is the purpose of our vocation. Mm -hmm. And so that people don't understand the abstinence part, like they just think all negative and it it really isn't because if we don't have almost forced opportunities of sacrificial love, I'm not running out there to try and develop sacrificial love for, you know what I mean? Like it's just like Lent. Right. It's like like every Catholic can embrace the idea that Lent, yes, it's kind of a drag when you first approach it, but then everyone realizes there's so much benefit. There's so many wonderful benefits. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's definitely not something to avoid. I mean, the other thing I would add to that is apparently sexuality is the only thing that we're supposed to have access to 24 seven with no restrictions, because that's not true for real life. If you have to have a medical procedure, you're going to have to, you know, abstain for a certain amount of time. Or if you're an athlete, like there's certain things you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And you go, you know what? I have to wait because I need to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And so that's true in every part of our lives. And then the other thing, like my husband wasn't military, but he did travel with his work. You know, I never worried about him trying to go find somebody else because he was gone for two weeks and we couldn't have sex for two weeks, you know? 
Um, you, I would trust him. He trusted me. And if you're military and deployed for six months, you're expecting your husband to not go find someone for the right. six months they're gone. Yes, that the whole term with marital chastity is just foreign to our culture. Right. But chastity really is an apprenticeship. The catechism says an apprenticeship is self mastery, mm -hmm. which, you know, and I always say you can't give what you don't possess. And if you don't have self mastery, and this is what Lent helps me do with my Diet Cokes mm -hmm. and all my other things that I have, I have my little addictions. Yeah. But if we don't have self mastery in our, of our sexual passions, how can we truly give ourselves as a sincere gift to the other? So, that it's the same thing, the sacrificial love. I love the word self-mastery, which is a word I learned from studying the catechism. So again, go to the catechism under chastity and under the sacrament of marriage. So the sixth commandment uh, would be a good place to start in the catechism and um, learning about chastity and then what marital love is, you know, what it, the church, the great call the church has for us. It's just so much in there. <laughs> well, and so much of it is also just being obedient to the church, even if you don't always understand it, just having that faith and trust that mm -hmm. God has put this in place for a reason right. and that there must, whatever that reason is, even if we don't quite, con you know, understand mm -hmm. it completely, that we should have that trust and faith to do it. When Brian and I walked into Providence Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina to learn NFP from Bob Nurbin, there were so many couples in South Carolina wanting to learn NFP. Father McCaffrey was there preaching it up. He was a, a military priest at the time and preaching it up in um, Columbia, but all over South Carolina, that was just there's this great fire for NFP. So there's so many couples that Ann Urban, who was the main teacher originally in Columbia, her husband, Bob, who's a physicist, a retired physicist at USC, had to go off and get trained. But Brian, I walked into Providence Hospital. There's a quote on the wall that said, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. And that's been my mantra for NFP. I just, we went in there blind, we were 22 years old, so I think I was 23. Brian was almost 23. But I just knew that the pill wasn't the answer. And my mother had tried to tell me, but, you know, she wasn't quite able to talk about those kind of things as well as, as we can now. But I knew that wasn't the answer. But I didn't understand what NFP would be in our married life. Yeah. We wanted to talk a little bit about myths, which we did kind of cover. I mean, any any final I have a myth that comments? I, like I have one, too. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> Go for this it. is one of my favorites is... People, especially on the side, the question says, myth busting, what are some common misconceptions about it from both ends of the spectrum, from those who are on, those who are pro contraceptives and those who are opposed to any form of natural planning, even NFP. And what I'd like to say to that end is I come from a mom who had five kids in six and a half years. A lot of people try to say, that, oh, if you breastfeed, then you'll be able to naturally space and you don't need to use NFP, you don't need to use anything. Right. And they might have had an experience where they could space three or four years with breastfeeding. But I am here to say that did not work for my mom. <laughs> she breastfed all of us entirely. And I it can be really easy to, especially young people, that's why I'm glad we're doing this podcast for young people that aren't married yet, because it's very easy to sit there as a not married person without kids to say, well, they clearly just didn't breastfeed or they didn't do this right or something like that, um, and to still con condemn NFP. But it is, especially if you have those types of genetics, I realized I had those types of genetics <laughs> very quickly because I was even using NFP and it's I still had Irish twins. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just really important to educate people on that because I think it's just a big misconception mm -hmm. and it's uh, just really important to support each other in that way because it's, NFP is already so hard to learn and it can be very overwhelming. So when you're afraid of your peers, your fellow Catholic peers, possibly judging you for that, that just makes the whole experience a lot harder. Right, right. And we never have the right to judge another person's child's facing choices. Right, right. We never know it, their situation. So I, that's a big mm -hmm. myth that I like to, to bust. Mm -hmm. I'm just like breastfeeding yeah. does not equal child space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it can, but obviously for not some, always. So but yeah, but is, people can't, you can't just be like, oh yeah, that's going to happen for me. Right. And so, it's getting mm -hmm. exponentially less common because of probably the hormonal stuff and the water. And I think a lot of other th issues that our generation is facing it's becoming less and less common that people can space that way i mean it did for me <laughs> um but yeah it's different for everybody so you Sarah, don't know you but so you just need to be a, like you in other words 
you can try and do that, but you still need to be aware of your fertility right. with using NFP, like right. being trained. And it's, it's not hard to learn NFP, but it does take some training. Yeah, you know, and it you, can be overwhelming at first, especially if someone's coming from a non-religious background and they're so. Yeah, but you can approach that from, hey, from the health standpoint. I mean, I've taught plenty of couples that are a non-religious background that they're like, oh, yeah, we're all about we don't want to take the hormones mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. well, and that's why we recommend that people get trained like six to nine months before their actual wedding date. Mm -hmm, so they right. have time to to do say, that along the lines of, um, you know, spacing the pregnancies. I think a common myth is that. Um, NFP requires us to have as many children as possible, and that's right. just not true. Um, I think those large families that you see are absolutely beautiful, but there's beauty in small families as absolutely. well. And there's that. a lot of really valid reasons that mm -hmm. people may want to delay pregnancies or space their pregnancies. Um, and that's really between, you know, a, a couple and God and, um, you know, praying about it, seeking spiritual direction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talking to a priest, things like that. Um, but that along those same lines, not to judge a family that is very small. Um, mm -hmm. They may have plenty of valid reasons or infertility yeah. reasons, right. things like that, that right. you just don't Secondary know. Secondary infertility. Like, like, that's yeah. what I was going to say. It, you know, we look at big families, we think, ah, oh, they're the good Catholics. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. They're right. beautiful families all around, and we have no idea what was going on in people's marriages. But One thing that really helped me when I was grappling with it, because I have a lot of friends that have a lot of kids, and mm -hmm. it's easy to compare, like, oh, I don't right. have another kid yet is that just like a healthy body looks different for everyone, right. like my body at a healthy weight looks different from someone else's, a healthy size family is di looks different for everyone. I I love just talking with, you know, all yeah. of you about this. Yeah. And yeah. I think my closing statement would just be, I love NFP because it allows us to be open to life and open to love. Mm -hmm. And Amen. it's just, it's a beautiful thing. My closing statement would be one of the questions we have, what if someone's overwhelmed and they don't know which method to use? Because I don't really have, a, since I'm retired now and I do know about all three different methods, that's what I like to do is help steer people in the direction where they, what the method that, that, you know, I can be a consultant. So if anyone needs to know about the different methods and what's the difference between them, you can call each one of us or you can call me and I can tell you a little bit about <laughs> each one of you and such because it's, each method is going to work um, for, for, you know, a woman might, you know, each woman is unique. And the methods are suited for her unique um, needs at that time. And financial needs as well. Financial yes. needs as well. Yes. Lots of options. Just, just, just educated. There's so right. much great information right. out there. Right. Anything you want to say, Sarah? Or are you good? No, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm glad to be here. We're glad y'all are here, too. We're <laughs> super glad y'all are here. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. This has been an episode of It's Catholic, y'all. Visit us at diosav.org or on our Diosav social media platforms for more.